pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, so the idea for this talk came about because uh, we, we both have experience uh, building 3D printing projects in the retail space. Um, uh, but mine isn't, didn't start naturally that way. Uh, I've, I'm a VC from Nigeria. Oh, I worked as a VC in Nigeria for five years before I moved to Silicon Valley where I started Authentize. I'll speak a bit more about that. Uh, now I'm also the digital manufacturing speaker or lecturer at Singularity University. Uh, and you're welcome to come up and talk to me about that later on. Um, so <coughs> well, what, what Authentize does now is uh, build software for 3D printing. And uh, we have a modular product. Most of you don't know about us, um, but our, our products are used by some of the leading websites in the space and uh, the leading companies to organize their processes around 3D printing. It's a modular-based platform for additive manufacturing. Um, lots of modules required to organize the process. And as uh, Sydney will say later on, uh, actually getting a part to print is relatively complex. And managing that process successfully, uh, repeatedly, is quite, com uh, quite difficult. So um, we've built software around that uh, to enable people to make that happen. But another thing we've uh, worked on the side is uh, building a company called Authentized Services that helps larger corporations um, engage with additive manufacturing in a, uh, uh, in a conducive way. So we work with Rico, we work with Wipro, and we work with Lowe's um, uh, to do their 3D printing project that released um, end of last, uh, no, uh, beginning of this uh, of 2015. Um, so what Lowe's, what we did for Lowe's was a pilot project to put 3D printing into their stores. Um, there were two aspects to it. On um, one side, you could come in and you could customize your door handle or fridge, fridge magnet or something that was uh, for your home. And you could do that on online too. You could do that in the store. Um, and then the other part of it was that uh, people could come with a, uh, a part that was broken and um, have it scanned. And we'd have a, a service that would fix the file and print that object for you. Um, so there were two different parts to the business. It actually took us about, I would say, six months to get this uh, project, uh, four months to get this project up and, go, uh, and running, technically, and then about another six or seven months to get it past legal. So uh, it was already a lot earlier than, than earlier this year. But that's um, the experience that we're building on, and uh, since then we've worked with a number of other retailers that aren't uh, quite as public yet. Um, but that experience gave us something as the project managers in the space uh, to think about. And if, uh, if I can be quite simplistic here, the takeaway for us was there were really two different aspects to this project. One was really exper experiential and one was functional. The scanning of spare parts that you couldn't get anywhere else, that was a functional object. That was a functional task. And the, the scanning of uh, and, the, and the customization of essentially door handles that you could buy cheaper or better uh, in the store, but that could have your personalized uh, touch and feel to it, that was an experiential uh, task. And so um, that really, the, the reaction of the customer to those two experiences or two, two different aspects of the project is what's uh, colored a lot of my thinking around additive. And uh, I... I'll sit and join us, and she will be speaking in a minute, um, because she represents a, a very successful experiential uh, project, whereby at Lowe's we realized that really um, the, the focus was much more on the functional objects, and that's where the customer demand um, was mainly. And if you think about uh, the options that a retailer may have in uh, engaging with additive manufacturing, um, uh, many of them are in the personalization space, are in the experiential space. They are uh, something that is nice to have, right? Whereby um, additive manufacturing as a, as a whole um, uh, has been, or the, the, the functional side can also be personalized, but it might be a medi medical custom fit. Uh, uh, initiative, or it might be a, 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 a part that you need uh, that you can't get anywhere else. So there are a custom uh, customization opportunities in additive manufacturing that may, may not necessarily be um, uh, experiential. Um, so I'm not saying that all the, all the opportunities on the left mean that there's no money in them, mean, mean that there's 
There's absolutely no opportunity. But what I, my proposition is, is that they, they have a much uh, smaller degree of opportunity than, than the, the functional opportunities on the right. And that really is colored by uh, an experience I made in Africa. Um, where I helped a, a large, the West Africa's largest oil and gas company distribute uh, five million gas cylinders to, um, to households, um, uh, saving 30 million people from indoor smoke inhalation. The reason people bought these gas stoves wasn't because they were uh, customized, because they were nicer, because they were better or in, in any way. The reason they bought them is because their neighbors had gas and their neighbors were rich. They were an aspirational good. Right, and, uh, and I, f I find that 99% of everybody that, uh, every product that is being sold, the, 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 this concept of personalization and, or the importance of customization or mass customization that we might see in fashion is a little bit overhyped, at least in, 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 the, in, in my experience. And, and the stats in, in additive manufacturing, 3D printing also speak to that. So when MakerBot sold to Stratasys, about 70% uh, of the sales were actually to SMEs, so uh, architecture bureaus, uh, uh, companies that were using the ma MakerBots for professional use cases. So this wasn't, there wasn't, the, the, the additive manufacturing industry has never really been built on people trying to customize things, or people, ma the maker movement, as you might say. It's always been built around people that were using additive manufacturing for a functional purpose, right? And um, and so uh, if, you, if you want to um, make something of the additive manufacturing industry for your own company, for the retail space, then, um, then my proposition is that the functional elements are served or you're serving uh, functional needs by addressing the, the long tail, by addressing not your, the individual, but a s subset of the of, of the overall consumer that may be too small for normal companies to meet or normal uh, company initiatives to meet. And these might seem incredibly small to start with, right? These are, these are initiatives that don't hit your bottom line in the same way that um, your, normal, uh, 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 your R normal ROI projects might, uh, might meet. But they are still important, they're still valuable uh, step because without them you don't learn about the technology about the customer demand and You may not find market niches in which you can actually scale an application or a product up. So uh, uh, there's a pitch there to actually um, de Start delivering services in additive manufacturing even though the revenue for those long-tail opportunities might seem relatively small to start off with um, These these revenue but the reason this these revenue opportunities are uh, seem small is because the total revenue is spread across lots of different demand segments, right? So what we're, what we're finding, take for example UPS. UPS has hundreds of people coming to it for 3D printing projects for hundreds of different reasons, right? They, they come with different kinds of files that are uh, differently prepared. There might be sketches, there might be CAD drawings, there might be CAD drawings that are ready to be 3D printed. So it's really challenging for uh, for a UPS or any other organization to react to that and create a standardized product, right? And, but th that's something that UPS has decided that it, it can and, and wants to do, and we're working with them now to, uh, in the back end, to be able to standardize uh, and offer all those services to different customers, even though they have different kinds of uh, demands. So my point here is that if you, just like um, uh, any other uh, project where you have a low volume but uh, a relatively high margin. Um, you have to find ways to increase that margin over time by uh, standardizing the services at least at a back-end level. And that's what we're seeing with um, the content services, for example. One opportunity that we've developed with um, uh, one of our clients is that uh, they've, they've realized that, that yes, the 3D printing is a, is a big reason why, uh, why we need 3D images of all the different objects that are sold within the company and uh, of, by, by the retailer, but also um, the subcomponents. Uh, they're realizing that these, these, uh, these 3D files are required for that purpose, but they're also required for other purposes. So from a back-end level, they need to have the 3D images in store, but the opportunity for them, um, uh, the, the, the challenge for them is 
that they have not a lot of technology out there at the moment that is uh, able to, scan, to create at scale the 3D images that they require. So right now it takes between four and 12 hours to scan an object and to make it 3D print ready. Um, in, uh, in, in various ways, you can either do it by hand or you can uh, CAD scan it in. So for a retailer that has 880,000 SKUs or a million SKUs, um, that becomes nearly impossible to manage, especially if the, the SKUs churn every three years or so. Um, so with them, we developed this concept of a, uh, an automated scan machine that we're, we're uh, uh, displaying together with, um, or we're working on together with a German organization um, based in uh, Darmstadt. And uh, what we're doing there is automating the scanning process so that we can scan an object every four minutes, down from every four to 12 hours. Um, so this is still under development, and to be honest, it, it requires a, a lead operating uh, agent to be able to put, put into practice. But um, the, the point I want to make with this is, um, if you accept that you have a, this dichotomy between uh, functional and experiential uh, um, opportunities in additive manufacturing. And in the fu then in the functional side, you are naturally driven towards uh, high uh, uh, low, low volume uh, projects because uh, you're operating at the, long, at the long tail. To serve those uh, long tail opportunities, you need to have back end technologies that make uh, services uh, possible. One, of, one such service is an automated scanning facility, but there are other opportunities that make that possible, like the ones that we're working on with UPS that I can't talk to you about. But there are uh, abilities that once you engage with the process of actually delivering services to your customers, you will understand what the underlying opportunities are or the underlying backend opportunities are, and uh, your company can engage with those and, del and start delivering at scale. So. I think I've taken enough time, I'll take Cindy to come up um, and speak a bit about the experiential side. Yeah, so as Andre was speaking, I decided we are a little controversial because he, um, he talked a little bit about um, how personal, the personalization trend and how he thinks about it in terms of impact and how big it is. And as a company, over the last three years, we've really spent our effort thinking about that area and thinking about um, you know, what it means in 3D printing. Because from our perspective, 3D printing is actually the perfect technology to actually extend what's happening in personalization. Um, and interestingly enough, kind of my first few slides go through that. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do um, as we go through. But um, as Andre said, what's, so I always approach this as looking at it from the consumer. So our focus has been, what is it that you know, 3D printing brings that is unique that we can do to create products for? So there's a number of different target markets that um, 3D printing has really started with. And it really started with things like hobbyists and makers and prosumers. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is that it's really extending into enterprise starting to use it and then it taking into the mass market. And we've been really focused on what does it mean for brands and channels to use 3D printing? And then how do we take products into the mass market um, and not just make one-offs? Let me tell you a little bit about um, why why we've been there. So one of the things I want to leave you with or you to think about is why is personalization such a really big trend? And it really is a big trend. I'll give you some examples. There's a couple of reasons that brands and channels care about personalization. They first and foremost carry, uh, care about it because it creates stronger ties to brands. So if any of you have watched the Star Wars franchise over the last, you know, you can't miss it if you're here on this planet. Um, you know, the projections for revenue were insane, right? It's now, it broke every box office, but not only that, every, all of the things of merchandising. It's an interesting brand to think about because it's been around for a very long time, but what that franchise has done very well is engage its fan base over and over and over again, which in turn drives an immense amount of revenue for them across all of their different channels and all of their different products. It means you engaged with it, you engage your children with it, there's entire generations that become attached to that. And the, the more I can make you feel part of a brand, the more likely you are to actually spend money and continue your re long-term relationship with the brand. That's the struggle of every brand, is how does it age with its fan base? Um, interactions with brands obviously travel further, and things where you are tied closer to the brand inspire actions. A Couple of interesting examples we have had 
I'm actually going to go straight to this one, is what happened in the soft drink world. So it's just a really interesting, completely not related to 3D printing, um, personalized merchandise. For, so for the first time in 20 years, software drink sales increased. Right? Software drink sales, they're plummeting, right? We're all getting, you know, going to water and to flavored water drinks. Well, for the first time, and how come? Because they made it personalized. They brought you, as the loyal fan base, into those actual products, and they delivered them to market. People searched for their names. They searched for their children's names. They made social videos. It had a massive impact on that brand, and it was all because they had a way to connect with their fan base, with those people who loved that product, which in turn actually drove significantly more sales. If you think back on a couple of slides, um, a couple of things that have been proven, if you look at any of the data, is that personalization elevates customer loyalty and engagement. Fans who engage in personalization are way more loyal to brands. Um, it happens that in footwear, personalization is also really big. If any of you, um, lots of people tend to buy personalized shoes, Nike.com has an entire site dedicated to making your own shoes. Sometimes it's just a name, and sometimes it's an entire color choice. But they do that because the fans who love them engage with them tighter, they stay more loyal to the brand, and they continue those relationships. And the same thing is true with our opportunities in 3D printing. Um, there are, so where we have focused, and where I really believe that the powerful intersection um, of 3D printing is in this intersection of brands and technology and channel. So if you approach anything in the retail environment um, from the perspective of there's this really cool new technology out there and we should put it into a retail channel, you've approached it the wrong way. That doesn't make any sense, right? Technology enables new types of things that have never before been possible, and our ability to find the unique applications for those are the things that actually transforms the market and creates the real opportunities to drive revenue. So as Andre said, I actually spent about four years at Disney working in the technology commercialization arm, and one of the most powerful lessons I walked away from, my experience there, was related to their story-driven culture. Everything in the culture is about the story, and it's not a marketing spin. A lot of time coming from marketing world, we think of story as marketing. What's the story that I'm going to tell? How am I going to position? Who's my target customer? But for Disney, story is much deeper than that. It's the entire emotional arc of any given content or any given piece of character. And they're amazingly great at developing those stories and then engaging people in those stories for long-term relationships. They do it across every channel that they own. And if you think about any experience you have, whether it's in a park or a studio or a game, they try to be very true to story. I once did a project related to Star Wars, and I had to learn the entire backstory of certain characters in order to actually develop that. As we worked with Imagineering, I had to know things that I never even thought that were out there in order to really appreciate the application that we were trying to integrate. And that's what they do really well. And so I came at the 3D printing world from an entirely different perspective, which was how do we actually create really powerful experiences for fans and then create unique products because that's what 3D printing is really good at. Um, and a couple of things that are tied to that story and tied to consumers. So I have a bunch of rules that I live by as I create product. One of them is you know, thinking about consumers. You have to remember a couple of things. Consumers hate friction. They actually hate thinking. And you get very few seconds to engage them in any activity you're giving, which creates an entire tier of requirements that you have to evaluate for applications that you might want to adopt. The average consumer, like if you're on, in an online on a web page, you get less than three seconds before they decide to abandon you. And in a store environment, when they're walking by, it's even less. Um, consumers only give you information and content if they see a value exchange. So how many times have you hit a website, and before you even get to the site or see the content, they've asked you for an email address? When that happens, majority of users abandon because there wasn't a value exchange in what you were, getting, what you were giving them for what they were getting. And the same thing is true in all types of retail experiences. There's also lots of different environments to drive purchase. If I can get you to come and experience the 3D experience at a World Series game, your propensity to purchase there is much greater than if you just walk through in a normal store. So there's all sorts of ways to think about how we engage users, what the form factors are, what those events are. And there are really big global trends around personalized in-store experiences. Every major retailer that I talk to and that I'm aware of is creating experiential retail sections. They are transforming their stores in order to create experiences that bring you into brick and mortar, but that tie you into digital worlds so that they can know more about you, they can create products that are specific to you, and they can create more time in the actual store, which in turn drives up their revenue. 
And technology is massively integrated into brick and mortar. Whether you look at innovation stores, Target has a series of innovation stores, Toys R Us does, Walmart does, everyone has series of those. And Apple is an entire experience store, right? You might buy product there, but what do you go there for? You actually go there mostly to experience product. That's what the stores are set up for. And that continues to be a really big draw uh, across all of the platforms. So let me give you a couple of examples that we've had the opportunity to work on just to get your mind thinking around what does it mean to create story-driven experiences that leverage 3D printing. So this holiday, there was this DreamWorks Cookie Maker app um, that launched, that we launched. Um, and it was tied into this whole story-driven experience. But at the end of the day, so we kind of blur the lines between personalization and customization. And when I say customization, I actually don't mean things like prototyping. I really mean things like your opportunity to get your, your hands on individual things. But this was an interesting application, and I think a really well-executed one. Because you had an opportunity, for those of you who are not familiar with the Shrek property, there's a character called Gingy, and Gingy's a gingerbread man. And you had an opportunity to go through and make your own cookie. And then you could actually buy it as a 3D printed ornament. And it has your name and your number, or your name on it, and all of the choices that you made as you went through this experience. And it was fully integrated into a DreamWorks um, environment. Um, and I probably can't share with you the stats, but a lot, a lot, a lot of people went through that experience. And it was so, it, it's such a darling experience because it just takes the storyline of Jinji and the entire content and the entire app leverages that, and then it ends up giving you a product out of it that ties you back into those properties that you really like. Um, and it's, it's, it's just really interesting because I think what it does well is it tells the story. And it uses technology to make it happen, but it didn't tell, sell you technology. You didn't walk up to an ATM and try to buy something. Because the coolest thing about 3D printing is there was no possible way to make this without 3D printing at mass scale. You can't make tens of thousands of these unless you have technology like 3D printing where you can print them and turn them around in three days. It's just not possible. And so the cool thing about thing, 3D printing is that we get to invent all sorts of new products we've never thought of before and, um, and use it where it's best served. If I need 10,000 of the same thing, I am not using 3D printing. That is not what it's good for. But if I can make a fan tighter into those brands and create experiences around that, that's where 3D printing starts to excel. I'm not gonna go through all of these in our time today. I'm gonna lay out for you that when we start creating experiences for brands, whether it be Major League Baseball or Marvel or Star Wars, we start from thinking about what is the compelling consumer experience that will engage people and that can drive conversion. Because you really have to understand your target demographic, your target market, and the opportunities that you have to engage them. In addition to that, I'm also gonna throw out to you that you have to also, I'll come back to those, also have to understand the technology limitations. So I have a whole series that sometimes talk about, which I won't talk about today, but in the world of retail, you actually have to get really close to your consumer, you have to understand the limitations of the technology, and then you have to build an experience that you believe people can use. And, and again, like the name of any new product, it's a bunch of experimentation. You test and you optimize and you see what works and you continue to push forward on those key learnings that you have time and time again. About a, about a year and a half ago, we launched our first iteration of a product called Super Awesome Me. Um, and we launched it actually in Walmart. You could find it in Walmart and Sam's Clubs and at Toys R Us all over the country. And what we had done is we worked with Marvel to basically let you become your own favorite superhero. And it was a really interesting application because actually who doesn't want to become a superhero? Um, one of their favorite superheroes. And eventually it led to the, other, the new line that we launched with Target this year that allows you to basically become your own favorite character. Um, and what's cool about applications like this and just getting you thinking around the types of things that 3D printing is good for is the body from this is actually mass produced over in Asia. But the face is what is 3D printed. And you go through an entire experience when you, when you, go, when you actually go into one of the Target stores in LA you can actually get your face scanned, you can see yourself in story, you can see yourself as the character, and it drives conversion. And I really think that, you know, it's been a really great product and test and, um, and launch rollout because it gave us the opportunity to see how people, um, how people basically respond to it, if they purchase it, all of the various steps behind it. And what we've learned is that if you can find applications like this, that use the best of both worlds and use 3D printing where it's very best at, you can create compelling products at compelling price points that people will use. 
And I think we have lots of opportunities. I actually believe we are at the very, very early stages of this. And I will tell you that we see time and time again, as we get in front of the right demographics, that the people that that users and fans and consumers are super interested in being part of their favorite brands. We were at the World Series this this year, and we were in the Mets Stadium, and we couldn't we couldn't keep up with the amount of volume of people who wanted to come through and get their own 3D printed character of them as their, as their player for their favorite team. And it's all driven because it feels like a story. It feels like for a moment in time, I stepped into Major League Baseball and I, become, I became part of a team. Because lots of people grow up wanting to be a pitcher for a Major League Baseball team. Right? Lots of people are dedicated fans to those. And so what I've learned, which really ties back to the experience that I had from Disney, is that those stories, that's how you close deals. That's how you sell, and that's how you get users engaged. And if you do it correctly, um, that's where the personalization comes out. I'm never gonna use 3D printing to make the same thing lots and lots of times, because that's not where 3D printing is good. And actually, I believe that that extends itself into the home improvement line, into medical, into architecture, because where we'll see the 3D printing applications are in the places where there is a unique reason for that to be unique to one person. If I'm gonna go build a lot of them, I'm not gonna use that. But if I need a specific object to go to a specific market, that's where 3D printing will excel, will, will excel. And the material choices continue to get better and better. We happen to only use full color 3D printing. And the reason for that is because the other materials don't create compelling enough product for us to get people to purchase. We have to use the full color platforms in order to drive that. And I think that goes back to the technology decisions you make when creating retail experiences. The most successful retail experiences understand the technology choices. They understand things like Andre said, which is scanning is still really hard. Scanning in a retail environment, figuring out how you can get high resolution scans of four-year-olds consistently, it's actually a really hard problem. Because lots of scanning technology requires movement, right? Or requires all sorts of other things. Or um, photogrammetry is really expensive because I need lots of different cameras. Right, so you're always weighing these trade-offs. And so when you think about the types of applications that you need in 3D printing, it's really got to be driven towards what are the technology limitations and what's the experience that is compelling enough for consumers to engage with. And I think we're at the very beginning. I think we are going to see amazing applications over the next three to five years using 3D printers in the retail market. And we're going to see them universal. We're going to see them continue to be in the home improvement markets. We're going to see them with brands. Every brand and channel will continue to evolve in this space, despite, you know, every market goes through its ups and downs. So despite the fact, right, that we have lots of consolidation going in and lots of refocusing of efforts, all that means is that the market is maturing enough so that we are going to drive applications. The use of 3D printers increase as applications demand rises and as 3D printing gets into the mass channel. And so we have to provide ways for it to get into the mass market because that ultimately is what fuels its entire market. And it's what it's perfect for. It does a lot of things really well, but when we need one product for one individual and time and time again, that's what it does really well, which is why prototyping started as its first application. Um, and I'm not gonna read through all of these, but just as um, if you're thinking about retail ideas, these are some of the points that we always evaluate. We always think about where the economics make sense. Sometimes there's an R&D investment way above where you're actually going to do implementation, but you have to understand that eventually you can get to an economic model that will work in order for it to be valid. Um, you have to find the right engagement moment. So for us, we learned, we learned time and time again that if we can capture you in certain moments, we can convert you at a high percentage of time. Right? And so by engagement, I mean, where should you be placed? How are you reaching those consumers? What is the format that you're engaging them on? Because it's like any other product. It's all about distribution channel and access to your consumers. And we are a big believer in testing and optimizing. We do not have all the right answers, nor does anyone else. But what we do have is good thinking and methodology that help us get to places where we can create product that that has, does have it figured out. We take all those key learnings and we implement them and then we scale them. And that's what make, creates the success in the market. Um, and again, the story driven and those other ones that you can see there. And the things I want you to remember in retail is that 3D printing is still new. It was only just over four and a half years ago that 3D consumers even knew what 3D printing was about. I remember doing market tests with users um, actually in some of the theme parks, and asking them about 3D printing, and there wasn't one person who could tell me about it. Now today, a lot more people know about it, but what that tells you is we're early, early stage. 
Lots, most of the people have not actually seen a 3D printer. We're an elite crowd where we actually use them and we adopt technology. But the majority of people haven't seen them. That also means that the technology itself is evolving quite rapidly and that it's not perfect. We spent a long time getting to a place where those full color printers um, could be used in a production environment where you could print thousands of units at any given time and get the quality that you want out of them. And any new printer takes the same thing. So you have to appreciate the logistical pipeline that it takes for 3D printing. And also because we're new, remember that costs are higher, right? As demand increases, that will put the price pressure and drive our costs down. Full color 3D printing is all derived by the um, cubic unit, the cubic centimeter of material used. The more applications we get, and that's the same for every material type, the more we'll see cost-effective solutions come into market. And I think you have to be really clear that things in 3D printing are experiments, that you're experimenting and you're trying to find the right application, and you're going to take the right steps to manage both your risk and your investment in that, and that you're going to have this continued plan going forward. Um, Disney theme park merchandise for four years now, when it's Star Wars weekends and Hollywood Studios in May, does this really cool 3D experience where you can become one of your favorite Star Wars characters. Um, and it has been super successful for four years running. And they continue to do it because it is so successful. And they found a way to experiment and get early into market and then continue to leverage it. And I think you'll see lots of things like that continue to happen. We've seen a lot of early experiments that I would say don't quite qualify for all the right things that 3D printing is good at. Um, but we're now on the brink of those actually accelerating, so the personalization is actually coming into them, and we're not just making things that I could buy at better quality and or less expensive from some uh, manufacturer out of Asia. Because it is true, if I can do that and I don't show enough value in my product, then people won't pay the premium price. You have to create a premium experience for a 3D printed product because the price is so much different. Mm -hmm.